Almost four years ago, I, um, I published a book titled Preaching Politics, which was basically a portion of my uh, doctoral work at Sewanee, University of the South. Um, it might make a good stocking stuffer in 2019, just putting that out there. <laughs> the intersection of faith and politics has always been intriguing to me, but even then I didn't fully appreciate how relevant that topic would be in our culture. People would ask, do you want to become a politician? Why do you care so much about politics? And my true answer deep down was partisan politics divides the body of Christ. And at a big tent church like Woodmont, we have to always work hard to make sure that that doesn't happen. Because the anger and the resentment and the vitriol is real. And it's not very spiritual. And the lack of peace and civility in our culture makes it more difficult to celebrate Christmas. We are now just three days away from Christmas. We'll have four services here on Tuesday, four and five o'clock, seven and 11 o'clock. If you want peace and quiet, don't come to the four and five o'clock. But if you have children, come to that. If you want candlelight and communion, come to the 7 or 11 o'clock. But it will be a special day uh, again here at, at, at Woodmont. But let me ask you this. How are you feeling? Are you ready for Christmas? Have you finished your shopping? Are you tired of the parties? Uh, have you gained weight this Advent season? What about the traffic in this boom town? How are you doing with that? Uh, that will put you in the Christmas spirit. I remember uh, a couple years ago, Tom Schuyler, when he was still here and on staff, he told the story about watching an old 85-year-old woman in a red Cadillac try to pull out onto Woodmont Boulevard, uh, which is not very easy or spiritual thing to do. And somebody just laid on the horn for 15 seconds at this sweet old lady. And without batting an eye, she raised her left hand. She extended the one finger salute and then she drove off. Now, I'm sure that wasn't a Woodmont Christian member, maybe a Woodmont Baptist member, or somebody else. <laughs> but it's about this time in the Advent season when we have about reached our tipping point. We are really tired, and many of us are exhausted. There was a column that appeared in the Tennessean a couple of years ago. It was a letter to Santa written by a lady named Beverly Keel, and she was asking Santa to help us move beyond the materialistic side of Christmas to the much deeper meaning of the season. She said, stuff has become a substitute for real relationships and connections and self-esteem. And time spent with our loved ones is what's important. Consumerism is an empty escape from reality, that one that is only momentarily satisfying because it ultimately can't fill the empty and lonely voids that haunt and taunt us. And so I hope that as we look at these next couple of days leading up to Christmas Day, that we can really focus on what the Christmas season is all about, which is the birth of Jesus Christ and the love that he brings into our hearts and into a world that desperately needs it. In the new year, I'm going to preach a sermon series on John's gospel. We're going to, to dive deeply into John's gospel. And so I would encourage you, if you're inclined, to start reading John's gospel, looking at John's gospel. But today, our gospel reading actually comes from John chapter 1, the very beginning of the fourth gospel. And remember, John's gospel is different from the other three, the ones we call the synoptic gospels. They are called synoptic because they are similar. They overlap. But John's gospel is different. Uh, John's gospel is unique. It was written in Ephesus sometime towards the end of the first century by St. John the Apostle. By this time, uh, two things had happened in the early church, the context of the early church. First of all, Christianity had gone out into the Gentile world, the non-Jewish world, largely due to the writings and missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. And secondly, because of that, Christianity had to be restated and re-explained because there were a growing number of people who basically were not familiar with the Jewish context and worldview. So those two things were going on when John's gospel was written. This gospel never mentions John by name, but we learn about him from the other three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He was the disciple whom Jesus loved. 
He was the one next to Jesus at the Last Supper. And you might recall that when Jesus was on the cross, it was into John's care that Jesus committed uh, his mother Mary when he was dying on the cross. So the four Gospels uh, are, are all unique and different. And it's nice that we have all four of them, but they've been described this way. Mark suits the missionary with the clear-cut account of the facts of Jesus' life. Matthew suits the teacher with his systematic account of Jesus' teachings. Luke suits the minister or the, the priest with his wide sympathy and his picture of Jesus as the friend to all people, including the Gentiles. But John is the gospel of the contemplative. John is the most spiritual of the four gospels. Clement of Alexandria once said this, John was not just interested in the mere facts of Jesus' life and his ministry, but also in the spiritual meaning of those facts. John was after the truth. John did not see the events of Jesus' life and ministry simply as events in time, but as windows into eternity. And so the language that we find in the fourth gospel is, is beautiful and it's poetic. And it begins this way, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. This is one of the most challenging texts, I think, in, in the entire New Testament. What do these words tell us about the nature of Jesus Christ and the nature of God? You see, for 75 uh, 70, 75 years, John the Apostle had thought about the life and the teachings and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And day by day, year by year, the Spirit had worked on him and it opened him to the meaning of all that Jesus said and did. So in the later years of his life, John decided that he needed to record what had happened, but also he, he felt the need to add some of his own theological interpretation of those events. And that's what we find in the fourth gospel. It's a beautiful combination of the events of Jesus' life and what John thought that they meant and symbolized. And so this is how he describes the incarnation. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light that enlivens every person was coming into the world. Remember what Isaiah said for telling the birth of Christ. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in the land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. And so while Matthew and Luke uh, tell the story of Christ's birth and they tell us about the shepherds and the wise men and the bright star that was followed, John tells us about the story of Jesus' birth in the fourth gospel this way. He says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of a father's only son, full of grace and full of truth. What I like about John's gospel is it gives us some insight into the predicament that we all find ourselves in as human beings, which is this ongoing struggle, this ongoing challenge between light and darkness. And yes, it goes on inside each of our hearts. I mean, aren't there certain people and aren't there certain situations in life that can keep us from experiencing the light? We all go through dark times. Depression, and despair, defeat, and disappointment, it's all a part of life. The light is there, but we can lose it. We can dwell in the darkness. And this is especially true when we go through tragedy or trouble or sorrow or sickness or death, when we get jealous or resentful, and all the other things that can make the light disappear for a while. Today, the Perry family lit the fourth candle on the Advent wreath that we call the candle of love. It symbolizes love. And if you stop and think about it, Christmas is all about love. It's, it's the love that pierces the darkness of our world. John sums it up in chapter 3 when he says, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. You know, we live in a world where it's often really hard to love others. We live in a world where people are, are, are selfish and where people are looking out for their own best interest. 
where people can be hateful and mean and cruel and rude, where it seems as though the nice guy finishes last. And sometimes if you put yourself out there and you love and you expose yourself and you make yourself vulnerable, then you might get hurt. And all of us, no matter who we are, live with this ongoing tension, I think, this ongoing struggle between the light and the darkness, the way that God calls us to be and the way that that our human nature, our sinful nature often uh, causes us to be. We all wrestle with this temptation and with this stress because we are capable of both extremes. Love is one of those words that we like to throw around a lot as Christians, but I'm, I'm not quite sure that we always know what it means and what it involves. I mean, Jesus gave us two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the greatest commandment. And love your neighbor as yourself. We know those things. We know that he said on these two things hang all the law and the prophets, but it's still not easy. It's still not simple. You know, I don't know about you, but I, I get tired of conflict. I get tired of people fighting. I get tired of of politics. I get tired of people who refuse to be peaceful. I'm very interested in what it means to to live as an agent of peace in this world. Not just a a nonviolent person, not just an indifferent person, but a peaceful person. We read the newspaper this weekend about two BGA graduates that were stabbed to death outside of a a bar in Midtown early Saturday morning. We get tired of these kind of stories. What does it mean to interact peacefully and positively with others? What does it mean to be a healer and a reconciler and not a divider and a manipulator. Peace must begin in our own hearts and then it must be applied to the immediate relationships around us. And then from there, it can spread out into our community. So on this final Sunday of Advent, as we get into the last few days of this Advent season, I wanna offer you four thoughts about what it means to love, what love can look like in our world, in our lives, in our culture. And I'm going to, I'm going to make sure you remember these because I'm going to base it on the word love. Okay. L-O-V-E. These are my thoughts for you this past, this final Sunday of Advent. The first word, the L word that I'm going to offer to you is the word listen. We listen to what others have to say and we listen to what God has to say. If you will listen, then God will speak to you. God will tell you what you need to hear this Christmas. There is simply not enough listening in our world. Everybody wants to talk, shout, argue, yell, tweet, text, post. It's not healthy. Listening is not something that we are very good at doing. Especially men, by the way. We have selective listening. Um, Megan reminds me and she can be talking to me and then she will suddenly say, what did I just say? Um, And I will tell her, uh, I'm not sure, but (laughs) I know it was important. (laughs) Please tell me that again. (laughs) See, listening takes practice, takes intentionality. When we pray, we shouldn't just talk to God and ask for what we want. We should listen and see what God wants from us. What is God trying to say to you this Christmas? What do you need to hear? What does God want you to know this Christmas? Maybe God is telling you to slow down. Maybe God is telling you to stop being so angry and frustrated. Maybe God is telling you to appreciate your family and to not take them for granted. Maybe God is telling you to quit trying to do everything on your own, that it's okay to ask for help every now and then. Maybe God is telling you to stop being so anxious and, and so fearful, but we won't know these things if we don't stop and listen. And if we wanna love each other, then we need to listen. We need to be still, to be quiet, to not always be in a hurry. We need to listen to the music and listen to our children and listen to our hearts. And you might just be amazed at what you hear. The second word that pertains to love this Christmas is the word others. The O is for others. Meaning in life comes when we learn to live for others and not just for ourselves. You see, our culture is facing 
an epidemic of loneliness, which, as we know, is leading to an increased number of, uh, of deaths of despair. More suicides, more opioid addictions, more drug overdoses. Many people feel hopeless and lost. Senator Ben Sass puts it this way. He says, there's a growing consensus that the number one health crisis in America right now is not cancer, it's not obesity, it's not heart disease, it's loneliness. He says social media companies promise new forms of community and unprecedented connectedness, but it turns out, it turns out, that at the same time that Billy Bob in Boise can broadcast his opinions to thousands of people, we have fewer non-virtual friends than at any point in decades. We're hyper-connected, yet we are disconnected. And so for all of our digital connectivity, for all of our social media presence, we don't know that many people very well. Some people say they don't even have one friend. They don't know who they would call if they were in a bind and if that person would pick up the phone and come help them. You see, love calls us to live for others, to not always be focused on self. The people who are the most miserable are usually the ones who are all wrapped up in self, and that's not what Jesus taught. He said, let them deny self, deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. And I think that happiness and meaning comes in life when we learn to love and focus on other people and not just focus on ourselves. Selfishness is an age-old human problem and challenge. The third word this Christmas, the V word, I'm going to change languages on you now, and I'm going to say veritas, which is the Latin word for truth. When we love other people in life, <clears throat> it means that we tell the truth. We tell the truth even when it's not necessarily easy to hear. We tell the truth even when it's not the reality that we wanted. One of the most exhausting aspects of this current political climate that we are in is that nobody seems to know what the truth is or where they can go to find it. I remember when you could come home and you could turn on the news and you could watch the news and you could find out what happened that day. Now you can come home and you can turn on the news and you can find out maybe what happened that day and also how you're supposed to feel about it. And how you're supposed to feel about it will just depend on the channel that you happen to pick, right? The people that you should listen to in life are the ones who will tell you the truth. Loving other people means that you tell them the truth. And if people disagree, that's okay. Um, I went to a great uh, lecture two weeks ago at MBA uh, where it was part of the Veritas Forum, but they had two guests. They had Dr. Robert George, uh, who is from Princeton, and Dr. Cornell West, who is from Harvard, used to be at Princeton. He's been at all the Ivy Leagues. Uh, George is a conservative, West is a liberal. They don't agree on many topics, and you could go down the list where they disagree. But they speak the truth, and they love and they respect each other, and their friendship and their mutual respect is big enough to handle their differences. We need more truth-telling in this world. And if you love somebody, then you tell them the truth, or at least you tell them what you believe to be the truth. Jesus said, you will know the truth, and do you remember the next part? And the truth will set you free. And many of us long to be set free. Lastly, the E in the word love is for everybody. We are called to love everybody. It doesn't mean that we have to agree with everybody. It doesn't mean that we have to spend time with everybody. It doesn't mean that we have to like everybody. But as Christians, we are called to love everybody because everybody is made in the image of God. 